So, hello, welcome back. Um, we're going to get started with this build now. Um, as I said before, uh, we'll start with the bodywork first. So, I'm just going to go through and identify which parts I need for that. Um, easiest way I do that is I check for the instructions for anything that needs to be painted the body colour. Um, in this it's marked with an X. As you can see here it shows X as the exterior colour. It gives a mix for the exterior colour but as I said before I won't be using that. I'll be doing my own. <coughs> Excuse me. So first thing we need is the footwell which is this part. I'm assuming that it's the underside that gets painted as the exterior colour. So using uh, Tamiya's side cutters, um, just because I like them, they do the job. The trick here is not to cut too close, if you can, to the part. You can clean it up afterwards with a blade. So, and then Next piece we need this rear wall, which is from the cab to the sleeper. The thing I don't like about Revel kits is the trees aren't that good. They're quite close to the part, so you have to take quite a chunk off and remove it later with a knife, otherwise you risk damaging the plastic, which you've then got to clean up. So That I'm assuming is the firewall, yeah. We just nick these off. I will speed this process up shortly because I'm sure you don't want to sit there watching me remove parts. Nothing there. So we now need the cab, which has got some pretty awful mould lines on it, along with some flash. Separate this from the hood. Obviously I'll go over cleaning up the parts later. Sometimes it can be quite difficult to cut because of the thickness of the trees, but it does come off fairly easily. So we've got that. Um, seats don't need to be done, we need the doors, which is on this tree. Two of them, obviously.
So I'm going to pause here while I find this part because I can't for the life of me find it and I'm sure you don't want to sit here watching me hunt for it for the next 10 minutes so I'll be back shortly. So we found it. It was on uh, one of the other trees. It's just here. So can get back on with this now. <laughs> Chrome part, so we don't need that just yet. As is normally the case, I normally get halfway through actually doing the painting for the bodywork and then find out that I've forgotten something. Hopefully, that won't be the case this time. So, I believe that's everything we've got off now. So, next step is to clean everything up. Um, rivel kits, yeah, they can be very hit and miss. Um, this one has got a lot of flash and a lot of mold lines, some of which are going to be really easy to clean up. Others are probably going to need a little bit more work. Moulding on the side of that hood is appalling. But we shall plod along. So when I come back, I'll go into a little bit about cleaning parts up but I won't spend too much time on it. Um, I know from my own experience of watching other people's videos that there's nothing more boring than watching people clean parts. So we shall be back shortly. Right, so we'll go over the basic process of, of cleaning up parts um, just for those watching that might be you know, might be new to modeling so this is the front mud guard and you can see there's a couple of bits that need cleaning up there's the nubs where it joined onto the tree and there's a bit of flash just around here i'm hoping this is showing up on camera so we're just going to go over um i normally start with a fresh blade because it's sharpest and a lot of the time the bulk of the work can be done with the blade and it's just a case of just carefully going over and just you let the blade do the work and just smoothing off where the excess plastic is see this is an example of what I meant by being careful how close you cut to the tree you can see that's actually taken a chunk of the plastic out with it um, not really much I can do about that at this point um, I could try and fill it 
but as it's on an edge it's going to be really difficult to do and it's so small that you're not really going to notice it. Um, you can try and hide it somewhat by just altering the shape of the parts slowly. It's got a bit of flash that needs to come off anyway. You get a lot of fine adjustments just by using the edge of the blade and just gently scraping along. As part of the cleanup process, you can see that's pretty much gone now. And it doesn't look like it was ever a problem either. So the flash on the inside, again, use the blade. You just carefully trim it off fairly close to the actual part. You'll find it comes off really, really easy because it's usually very, very thin plastic. Just take it off as close as you can. See the majority of that's come off now. The rest cleanup can just be done with the edge of the blade. And um, I also use Tamiya sanding sponges for this process. I've got 400,000 and a 3,000. Uh, smoother the higher the grit you go. So we've got some an edge on here. Doing this at a slight angle allows you to smooth the edge a bit as well. You don't want the edge too crisp for anything you're going to be clear coating. Um, it tends to cause a problem with the way the clear coat hardens. So you just carry on working around the piece, identifying as you go. This has actually got some jet pin marks on the inside. I'll go over those later because they're a different animal altogether. Um, some can be filled if they're recessed, some can be sanded down if they're above the surface. Personally, okay I'm going to go over this now, Personally, I make a decision based on where it is. Um, if it's not going to be visible or if it's going to be extremely hard to see, then for the most part, I tend to leave them alone. Um, I'm not building for competitions. I'm not expecting anyone to go around my model with uh, a steth uh, stethoscope, whatever those little tiny cameras are called. Um, uh, you know, I'm not looking to win any awards. I just build because I enjoy it. So personally, I don't really get too stressed about dealing with the ejector pin marks. Um, and to be honest with you, filling and sanding, or well, sanding I'm okay with, filling is a skill that I still struggle with even now. So I tend to, like I said, if they're blindly obvious, then then yeah, they need to be dealt with. But if they're not, I tend to leave them alone. Um, and that's, that's all there really is to, to cleaning up parts. We'll go over mould lines in a bit, because again, that's a different process. Um, at the minute, I'm just focusing on where the parts come off the tree and any flash. Um, for instance, the, the mould lines that are on the back of the cab, um, that's going to need a fair bit of work. Although, again, it's not going to be all that visible. I'm guessing that doesn't go on there. By the time you've built the rest of the cab, you're not going to be able to see that. You're going to be able to see the top one, maybe. Although that piece will go on there. So yeah, the top bit will need to be done. But these side bits probably won't need too much 
stressing about because they're not going to be visible. But they still need dealing with. They just don't need to be perfect. So back to the mudguard. I think we're almost done on this now. It's just softening the edge, as I said before, um, with anything that you can be clear coating, the sharp edge can, in my experience, cause problems. Because as you can see, the bulk of the work is being done with the blade. And then after that, it's just a case of just lightly going over with the 400 just to take the bulk of the material off. Just be careful not to touch the surface of the plastic, otherwise you're going to put some pretty horrendous scratches into it. Um, you can also do this wet as well, but for this bit, not really needed. See, that's still a bit out of shape there from where that flashes. So again, so again, you can test fit things as you go. Obviously, that hole's going to need widening. Because you want to aim for a, a nice snug fit to avoid any gaps or filling that might be needed later. I need to get rid of this so that I can test fit this mudguard and see where I am with that. Obviously, as I said, that hole's going to need opening up before this will fit. Let's do that now. So again, if it's flash, it's usually pretty easy to cut, although this is quite a thick piece. Thick piece of plastic here. It's going to need a um, fair bit more work, which I'm probably going to end up doing off camera. So I'm going to go off camera and sort this out and we'll be back in a moment. So I've got that opened up. You can see I get a fairly, fairly snug fit. Um, once that gets glued in place, that'll mitigate a lot of that gap as well um, as the glue I use. I use Tamiya Extra Thin, which melts the plastic somewhat to create the joint. Um, and it doubles up as a great gap filler. A very snug fit. So once you've got the bulk of the the flash and the edges sorted, just soften everything back up with a higher grip sandpaper. Just again, just to take those edges off. Like I said, I'll deal with those in a separate separate video. Just go along gently. This is just basically now smoothing off the damage that you did with the 400 grit. It's still got an edge on it. And 
is do this at a 45 degree angle because then you create a, a natural curve that does not want to come down. Again, doesn't matter so much about this bit because this this inside face will meet the side of the hood. So that's a bit better. And then use the three thousand grit to smooth everything off. Again, you do somewhat repeat some of this when you're prepping for priming. Again, cover that in a separate separate video so yeah and that, that's basically basically all there is to the initial cleanup phase anyway um, normally you do several passes with with cleaning up parts um, a lot of the time you'll find after you start applying primer that you'll find some more cleanup that you need to do that's the purpose of primer so just work around the rest of the parts and I'll come back to you when that's done. Okay, so I found a good mould line to use as an example on this cab. Um, this line down here. So hopefully you can see that. Um, Needless to say, that looks pretty awful. I've already done this side. As you can see, it looks a lot nicer. Um, I haven't done anything with this little recess here because this is where the sun visor slots into. So it helps locate that into place. So that needs to stay there. But this bit obviously definitely needs dealing with. So the way I do this is again a start with a blade. Now obviously you've got to be careful because you don't want to put massive scratches in your plastic. Use the blade vertically and you just gently scrape along the panel line and you want to try and remove as much of this as you can without actually scratching the plastic. Uh, the reason for this is because the mould line is really really close to some quite subtle rivet detail and you want to try and avoid sanding that off as much as possible. You are going to lose some because of how close it is and how subtle they are there's there's no real way of avoiding that um but you can try and mitigate that as much as possible um you can also change the direction of where you have the rest of your blade pointed so that you avoid scraping this off this is actually further down on this side But we should be able to get the majority of it off without affecting these rivets here. The other thing you want to watch out for is, especially as this is just on a curve, is you don't want to make a flat spot. So you can just alter the angle of your blade as you're doing it, just to try and keep that curvature there. I'm not putting any pressure on this at all. I'm just scraping it along. I'm not pushing down into the plastic. I'm just scraping along it to take off that panel line as much as possible. You can use your finger just to feel. This is more about feel than seeing or as much about feeling than it is seeing. Um, but you can see that's started to, to take the majority of it off. And you just carry on working. This bit is, can be a little bit difficult because it's white plastic, so it's really difficult to see. And you've got a lip here 
for the door rubber and a lip here for the window chrome, for the window trim. So it's trying to avoid touching that as much as possible. And it's still getting rid of the mould line itself. So again, I'm not going to do too much with this. I mean, there's a bit there that needs dealing with, but I'm not going to do too much with that because that's a locator for the sun visor. So for now, I'll just work up as far as that. I'll deal with this off camera. So that's coming off now there is a little bit here which i think that's actually a panel anyway by the looks of the rivets along it so i won't go along it's just this vertical line that needs dealing with so the bulk of it as i said is done just gently using the blade the edge of the blade just check and see how much you've gone. There's some more here which needs to come off. This bit is especially difficult because, as I said, you want to avoid flat spotting it. Because that's, well, there's pretty much nothing you can do about that if you've done it. Because then you have to start taking plastic off in a larger radius around you want to take as much off as I said get as much of this off with the blade as you can before you need to start sanding because that's when you're going to start to lose surface detail obviously you know some detail you can go back and add like the, the recess panel line here, if you know you need to, you can add that back by scribing later on. There's a bit there and it just will not go. You sometimes get some stubby bits. You just have to change the angle of your blade and just work it. It's very exploratory as you go. But you can see the majority of that now is is gone. The rest of it is done using some sanding sponges. Um, I don't always work completely up the grits. Um, for this, I'm not. I'll be using 600, 1000, 2000 and 3000 to finish off. Um, I'm starting on 6, 000, uh, 600 rather because I've got the majority of it off with the blade. If you've still got a lot left that you can't get with the blade, you'll have to start with a lower grit, which then I would recommend wet sanding because you're going to put a lot of scratches on. And so with 600, it's just, it's a case of smoothing off the damage that you've just caused with the blade. Again, you want to try and avoid sanding off the lips for the window and the door trim. Um, just use your finger just to feel if there's any rough. Now, I mean, there still will be a little bit of roughness because of the grit that I'm using. But you sort that out afterwards. You just want it even and level at this point. Um, good thing about these sand sanding sponges is this sponge, so you can mould them into any shape and you can really get into a, a tight area without needing without it needing to be flat. You just work it, try and go in the same direction and like I'm doing. Sometimes you have to use a different direction. You will also find that as you're doing this you'll find bits that you need to go back a step. I found a bit here, um, just on this bit here, that I need to go back 
go back to the blade because it's still quite proud. Usually doesn't take much once you get to this point though. Sometimes it can be stubborn bit. But you do have to just gently nip off. That's it, that's gone. And then go back to the go back to the sponge. Carry on working. Uh, I'm going to speed this next bit up so that you're not sitting there watching this for so long. Going into the next grit now. Now this is all about, well, there's still a little bit there that I need to deal with. So back to the blade. Try and get that as flat, flat as possible. This panel line is probably going to need rescribing after I've done this. grit up now as I just said. Now you, what you're doing now is you're making the plastic smooth again and get rid of the scratches that you've just put in by using the 600 grit. You can do this wet. Um, sometimes it's better to do it wet because you, you create less damage in the first place, still an issue there. That actually looks like a dip. Yeah, that's a dip rather than a flush line, which is a little bit trickier to deal with, but not impossible. You don't always need to resort to filling for this. It depends on how much plastic around it you've got to work with. You also sometimes get to a point where you need to make a decision of whether it's worth dealing with or whether you can dis disguise it enough with your, your primer should also do a lot of filling as well for very minor issues, which helps. So 600 again, just smooth off what I've done, and then back to the 1000. That's better. So now working up the grit, 2000 now. And then finally, the 3000 grit to smooth the plastic back off. Um, you can be a little bit more broader with this because unless you've got some incredibly fine surface detail, you're not re it's not really going to remove much material, so it's not going to damage too much. Although you should still try to be direct, targeted and avoid 
going over anything that you don't want removed. But it's just not as critical because it's a finer grade. So there you go. Like I said, this panel line I'll probably have to rescribe a little bit later because and the same on that side because that's it's almost completely gone on that side. But that rather nasty line, once that's primed, you're then not going to notice that. Um, again, same principle for, for any other areas. Some of them need more work. So you might find you have to start with a lower grit sanding sponge. But the process is the same. You just work up the grits once you've got the material removed that you need to remove. So I will crack on with that and we will come back soon. Right, so we've moved a bit forward with this. Um, quickly wanted to touch on dry fitting as you're going through the cleanup process. It's really important to do this so that you can make sure that you've got a good fit between the parts and address any issues before you start putting paint down. If you start having to hack away and, and reshape things once you've done your painting, you're going to wreck your paint job. There's, there's no two ways about it. So uh, oftentimes things will just dry fit together and a lot of the times, depending on the kit, a lot of the times they'll, they'll hold themselves together. Um, there's no glue on that, it's just all completely dry fitted. So you've got the cab, the sun visor, the, the internal back wall, the internal floor and the firewall. And they're all dry fitted, they go together well, there's no, there's not going to be any joint issues once I start gluing things together post painting. or before painting, depending on what you're working on. Um, same with the rear, the, the sleeper cab. Um, I did actually have to use a bit of tape just to hold the parts together for that. Um, the floor's just loosely sat in there on its nubs. But again, you just want to make sure that everything's going to fit together nicely. Same with the roof. Um, the roof needed a little bit of reshaping on the bottom edge and the same with the, the top edges of these parts to get it to, to meet up. I'm undecided whether or not I'm going to glue this roof on because there's going to be a lot of detail in there that's going to get lost and be really hard to see. But with fitting it on, with just not gluing it on, you can't really do much about any small gaps. So it, it's a trade-off. Uh, it, it's a trade-off between between that and having the internals accessible at a later date. If you were so inclined with having it this way, you could possibly add lighting to this and have easy access for a battery and a place to put it. Um, again, you would have to omit some of the detail that goes in there, but if you were inclined to do that, it would be fairly easy to do. Truck kits are good for lighting because there's always usually plenty of space somewhere to hide hide the power source without having to rely on a, an external power source. Um, another truck kit that i am got in progress it's on the back burner for a while now. I've actually fitted the battery inside the fuel tanks. Um, the, the fuel tanks are in two halves on that kit. I haven't got it available to show you. And I use some little neodymium magnets to hold the two halves together. And that works really, really well. Um, you could do something similar in this if you wanted to. I'm not going to because it's a lot of extra work and it's just not work I'm willing to, 
it's not time I'm willing to invest in this particular kit. Um, something I would consider with one of the, the Italeri American truck kits like this, because they're so much better quality. But for this, I'm not doing lighting. So anyway, going back to dry fitting, everything seems to, to fit okay. Unusually, kits that have separate doors for opening doors, I tend to hate because the fit is usually appalling between the doors. But on this, it's actually pretty, pretty good. Um, there's very, very small gap with the shape of the door. A lot of that will be mitigated once I start adding paint, especially with the 2K clear, because that goes on quite thick. So a lot of that gap will disappear. But it's actually, considering it's Revel, I, I shouldn't speak down of Revel, because they, they are good, but they're not known for their fit. Um, it's it's pretty good. That one won't fit in yet because I haven't started cleaning it up. So it's still got some nubs. But generally, there you go. Generally, they fit really, really well and really snug. Which is a nice nice change. So I'm almost done with the basic cleanup stage. So I'll crack on with that. And then come back when we are ready to start planning what to paint and when. Probably will do some of the internals first so that I can get these parts assembled before I start priming and painting them. Um, I try to, with bodywork, I try to assemble as much of the bodywork as possible prior to painting so that you don't end up risking damaging paintwork when you're trying to assemble things together and um, because it does happen it will happen despite your best intentions so right i'll be back soon right so we're ready to start putting some paint on um we're going to do some of the interior first now the reason for that is as i've previously stated i want to be able to assemble as much of the bodywork as possible and with this that means that doing that will make the interior difficult to access so I need to do the interior pan panels first not all of them but the majority of them so we got the the floor of the cab and the rear of the cab the cab itself um, just the roof mainly because the sides will be in the body colour um, and obviously we've got the parts for the sleeper cab as well floor and roof so I'm just going to quickly get a coat of white primer down on those and then move on to some colour so I'll get that done now and be back very shortly okay so everything's primed in Tamiya Fine Surface Primer White um, from a rattle can. I didn't use the rattle can, I just decanted it and used it through my airbrush as you get a lot more control from doing it that way. Um, doesn't take much, just a single coat, dries really quickly. So colour wise, um, I've done a little bit of research online and I've decided I'm going to go for a two-tone beige and grey interior. Grey for light grey for the roof. Uh, this one is actually uh, FS16440. It's one of the US Navy colours I believe. And sail colour from both from Mr Hobby Cell colour number H85 will be for the beigey interior for the walls and for the floor, for the carpet, I'm going to go for a darker grey. Not really decided what colour yet, it will just be a darker tone. Let's see what that one looks like. 
yeah, possibly that one. Possibly that one. So I am going to need to do a little bit of masking um, inside the cab because these walls will be the body colour and also the grey will start from this top row upwards and the beige down. So I'll do the beige first, let that dry and then mask off where I need to and do the grey. So I won't need to do that one or that just yet, all those. So it's just going to be these ones. For the sleeper cab, um, I'm not sure where I'm going to do the demarcation for that because the cab roof will probably be the best place to do that. Although I could do it one row down. I don't know. We'll see when we get to it. So I'm going to go off and get the beige sprayed and I shall be back very shortly. So that first coat's down of the uh, cell colour. We'll, we'll call it beige because it's easier. So it's gone down nice and smooth and it's dried quite quickly. Now I wanted to add a little bit of depth to this because that looks quite plain and still looks like plastic. Um, now I was going to try and pre-shade but I decided against that because it would be too much faffing around. So instead, what I'm going to try is, if you can see that there's very subtle surface texture um, and it's recessed lines. So what I'm going to try and do is brush over it with some brown Tamiya Panoline Ascent colour and see if I can just bring out some of that details. I don't know how this is going to go, so it might not go the way I plan. And I'm also going to do this live on camera, so it could end up being a disaster. I've got to try and figure out the best way of doing it. I think I'm probably going to use larger flat brush and just brush it on let it dry or maybe I won't let it dry I'll brush it on and then pretty much try removing it straight away if that doesn't work then I'll brush it on let it dry and then carefully remove it with a little bit of white spirit normally you should gloss before you do this to protect your paintwork. Um, I'm not going to because the, the effect I want is I want it to bleed slightly so that I don't end up with crisp sharp lines and it, it looks more feathered and it'll look more natural I think. So we'll see. So I need to give these a damn good shake because they've been sat untouched for months so they will probably be pretty well settled by now. So give them a good shake. Just have a look. And I'll just test on a little bit that's going to be hidden, just to see what it looks like. Actually, might that might end up being a bit too dark, but when I wipe it off should be okay. I'm not going to be using that brush. So I'm going to be using this one. So you don't need much of this because it's very, very, very fluid. I'm also going to do this before I, I mask off and do the, the grey at the top as well um, because otherwise I'm going to be using the grey panel liner for that and I don't want it to blend in. So that might be difficult with doing it afterwards. We'll worry about that when we get to it. So just lightly brush that on. I'm hoping you can see me doing this. 
Don't need to be too exact around the frame because that's going to get painted separately anyway. playing with the how much I want on just deciding what sort of effect I want to go for don't want it too stark I don't want it too subtle either It totally, obviously, totally changes the tone, which is why I went for a really pale beige to begin with. If I'd have gone for the sort of darker beige that I'm ending up with, then by the time I did this, it would have made it darker still, which wouldn't have been the effect that I want. Just trying to touch up and just even it out a little bit. just to remove this. I don't want it too dark in the recesses. So yeah, I think that's going to look quite nice. You'll notice I didn't do anything about the ejector pin marks that are on this, which are in terrible places main reason being is because of this surface texture if i start sanding their recess so if i start filling them and then sanding i'm going to lose all of that really fine surface texture around them and it's just going to look even more noticeable for the most part none of them are going to be visible anyway um, for the ones that are in the back of the cab i am tempted to try and make those look like internal lights just to disguise them a little bit but we'll get to that later I quite like that I'm actually reconsidering now looking at that whether or whether to go for the two-tone or whether to just keep it like that we'll see so do that one Opposite sides, but see if see that started to dry, so I'm getting a different tone. So that needs to be darker. Now that's had a couple of seconds dry, and you see what I mean about the way it's just blended in. It's just taken. It's not crisp like that, which 
that isn't what I want. That's the effect that I want. But I think this could do with a little bit more on, just to darken it down. So you don't need much of this on the brush because it's very, very thin. So don't want it to pull either. Side. And then do this piece next. Although this doesn't quite that's not quite dry yet. So we'll leave that one for now, we'll come back to that one later. This one I was gonna do the door panel in a different shade, but I think I'll leave it as it is. Carry on working around. Way too much on the brush there. It's a good thing that you can use the brush just to soak it back up if you do put too much on. these gaps there's um, internal parts that go there so I don't need to worry about covering those there's no detail on them to pick out anyway Actually quite impressed they managed to carry the surface detail around the corner because normally with some older kits when you've got a part which goes around you normally only get the surface detail on the flat edge and then on the top bit there's no detail at all so it's actually good that they they carried the detail around otherwise it would make this very very difficult to do These aren't drying the same. That's not too bad. I might need to go back over these again at some point. And this does look like it's having a reaction. This is why you should gloss first, but as I said, the gloss just wouldn't work for this effect.
Maybe the downside to this stuff is it takes forever to, to properly dry. Not as bad as oils, but not far off. may possibly end up having to go over this with a very thin shade of some sort of beige just to even things out. Um, that's going to need a coat. A coat of varnish over it first otherwise it just won't go over the enamel very well. Same thing again. Probably going to take me a couple of attempts to get this right to try and match up with that first piece, which I'm not sure why has gone so radically differently from the rest. But obviously, that I will do off camera, so not all you senseless watching me try and figure it out. Once I do. I will obviously let you know what I did. That's what I'm going to do. It's not quite dry in the bottom corners, but I'm going to chance it.
So I'm going to let that dry off for a few minutes and I'm going to go off camera and play a little bit, play a little bit with it, see, I might give this another coat, see if I can bring that out to the same as the other parts. I don't know why it's gone so differently. Better. I've gone the other way now to the effect that I want to. This is normally the case. I get a rough idea of what I want to do. And then I normally end up tweaking it as I go. Make sure there's no air bubbles. So, so I'll leave that to dry for a little bit. And then we'll come back and see what we're left with and see what we can do. So I've progressed somewhat with the interior. Um, I've done the, the grey for the floor and the roofs. I've also gone over them with a wash just to give them a little bit more detail and just make them a little bit more look like more more like carpet than just painted plastic. Um, I stuck with the darker grey for the colour as I had another look at the lighter grey and it was just way too light. And I used the dark grey panel liner just as a wash to bring out the detail. And I say it looks much better than just plain plastic. I've also done the, I'm not quite sure what that is, it looks like a carpet runner to me that you get in your house, but I've masked off and done that in matte aluminium. You can see I've got some bleed on the bulkhead. That's unfortunately with using a wash and trying to mask, you're never going to stop it from running under, it's just too thin. But that can just be tidied up when I do the, the body colour painting. For the interior doors, um, I did those in grey. Um, my research seemed to suggest that the doors were were done in, in a different colour upholstery. And I loosely masked off and did the, the door seals in a matte black. And same with the, the walkway through from the cab. to the sleeper unit. Now for some reason the interior wall, the back wall for the cab, seemed to go a lot lighter. Um, I'm not quite sure why. It doesn't really matter. I've got lots of dust here. It doesn't really matter too much as long as it's all an even colour. It's the only part of the cab that gets done in that colour as anyway. And I've also just roughly done the roof. It's going to be quite hard to see the roofs anyway, so I've not spent too much time on those. For the next step, um, it's getting the body ready for painting and I need to do a little bit of assembly first. There is some other bits for the sleeper cab that I need to do but I can do those later I don't need to worry about those just yet um, because it's only the outer walls and the floor of the cab that I need to assemble at this point for the sleeper unit that I need to assemble um, same with the cab I don't need to do much else on that I could fit this but I don't really see the need um, at this point. I need to make sure that I get the there's the inner surface of this part. It does stick out. I think it's designed that way to, to form part of the door frame, to stop the doors from just going completely inwards. So I'll need to make sure that that's the body colour as well. Um, obviously the door trim. That'll be rubber. Again, I'll do that afterwards. 
so yeah that's where we're up to so far so when i come back i'm hoping to have the sleeper unit assembled and a kind of primer down white primer down on everything and then we can go through the next steps so we will see you shortly right <clears throat> so we've got a coat of white primer down on everything that needs to be primed at this stage anyway not really much to say about this um, decanted Tamiya white surface primer got a few issues I need to deal with there not quite sure what those marks are they weren't there a few moments ago um, easily enough so but that won't be a problem because this has got to have a, a silver base coat put over the top of it ready for the mica red a bit fiddly to do in places um, this was tricky to get masked off and find a way of holding it at the same time um, but it's fairly secure you probably will notice that I've still got two big seams joint lines front and back. Now normally they would need to be dealt with um, ideally before you put any primer down. However, neither of those are going to be particularly visible because this section will, the back ones, will be on there anyway so you're not going to see those and the back it's got a big aluminium panel or steel diamond plated steel whatever the, the big panel is that are on the back of these trucks will go over that so it's not going to be visible so I didn't waste my time dealing with them um, they're not really noticeable from the inside because of the way the, the interior is. So, yeah, that's probably going to be about it. I say probably, it is going to be it for this part. When I come back with the next instalment, I will go over applying the base coat, silver base coat, and then the mica red. Um, and depending on time, doing any trim that needs doing before decals and a clear coat. So thank you for watching and I will see you next time.